the, cu the couple months um, in Kentucky with GE Aviation, doing some work for them. Right now, I'm currently working for a place here in Marala called Brewer Science. Um, they're a semiconductor company. And this summer, I've got an internship with a place called Catalent in Kansas City, Missouri, um, and they're pharmaceuticals. So I'm graduating next semester, got a little bit of, little bit of time left, but it's good, I really enjoy it. Um, I'm Sophie, I'm also a senior. Um, so I was also on co-op last semester. I was in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I um, was working at Sandia National Laboratories. I've also done um, research with professors on campus, and I'll be doing a uh, research this summer on campus. Alrighty, so with that being said, let's jump right into it. Again, we're really excited you all are here and we hope you enjoy this presentation. So just a brief outline of what we're gonna to talk to you guys about tonight. Uh, we're both part of a student group called Paramos and that's the National Ceramic Engineering uh, Professional Fraternity. So we'll give you a brief overline into what that is and kind of what we do. I'll give you a little bit of an overview into the student groups we have here on campus in the ceramic engineering department. I'll give you a brief introduction to material science as a whole, and then I'll go into a deeper analysis into what ceramic engineering is, and then I'll get right into some demonstrations to show you guys some of the really cool applications for ceramics. So like I said, we're a part of Caramos. Um, we're the National Professional Ceramic Engineering Fraternity, and this, this chapter at RALA is the number one chapter in the country, and the way they decide that is based on things like outreach, things like this, um, how we support our department, how involved we are with each other, stuff like that. So across the entire country, our chapter is number one. And what comes along with being in Caramos is there's a lot of service events you can get involved in. There's socials, so you can get to know the people in the department better. There's lots of networking opportunities. A lot of alum come back and if they're part of Caramos, that's something you can start um, a conversation with them about. We do resume reviews all the time. So if you've got a resume that you need checked over, send it to anyone in Caramos, they'll look it over. We also do lots of interview practice, especially around career fair time, so that's really helpful. And we also have the ms &T conference every fall, which is just a big conference where ceramic engineering and metallurgical engineering departments around the country come together and do fun competitions um, to show off the cool things that materials can do. So the student groups we have in our department include Gaffer's Guild, Material Advantage, Cast, and Blacksmithing, and AFS. So Gaffer's Guild is our glass blowing club. We do have a full hot shop on campus. So these pictures down here, these were made on campus by students. So it's really cool. There's a class you can take to learn the basics. At the end of the class, you can make a bunch of like paperweights and cups. And then after that, you are in Gaffer's Guild and you can go in anytime and start making stuff, blowing glass. Um, we also have material advantage and that's kind of the overarching department organization. So that includes both ceramics and metallurgy. We have CAST, which is ceramic artists of s &T. So they do stuff like this. They do lots of ceramic pottery and um, stuff like that. So that's a newer one. That one's really cool. Really excited about it. We also have a blacksmithing club. So anything you can do to blacksmith, I don't have any experience with that because I'm ceramic. So um, but we do have blacksmithing and then AFS is the Caramos version for the metallurgical engineers. So a brief intro into what material science is. It's the study of solid matter. And what we do as material scientists is we control the microstructure of materials and try to manipulate that so we can affect the properties of the material as a whole. Um, and most materials are one of three options, ceramics, metals, and polymers. And like I said, we have ceramic engineering and, metal en and or metallurgical engineering here at S&T. Um, and then we also have material science engineering uh, graduate degree, and that's, that encompasses uh, both of those. So a brief overview into what metals and polymers are. Uh, the staples of metals, I'm sure you all know, they're very electrically conductive. They're very high strength. They're malleable and ductile. And if I asked you to come up with an example of a metal, I'm sure about all of you would be able to come up with something right off the top of your head. Polymers consist of long chains of polymers, and those are your things like plastics, foams, styrofoams, those kinds of things. So we don't really deal with that here, um, but that, that is another branch of material science. And so here's the good stuff, ceramics. We deal with non-metallic, non-organic solids. And there's two types of ceramics including traditional and advanced. And the staples of ceramics is that they're really strong in compression, 
a really, really weak intention horses. They're very brittle, but they're very electrically and thermally resistant. So down here, I've just got a bunch of uh, examples of what ceramics are. And I'll kind of go into what more of those mean and what they look like in just a little bit. So this slide is full of a bunch of different companies. Um, everyone needs materials. So ceramic engineers work all over the place. There's a lot of really big names on here. So if you see any of these names up here and you think those are really cool places, ceramics are the, are the place to be because everyone needs materials, everyone needs ceramics. The starting salary for a ceramic engineering undergrad from S&T is 58 to $63,000 a year. So that's just, that's just undergrad, no masters, four years in and out. You can be making around $60,000 a year um, right out of college. Um, and what's also really nice about ceramics engineering is our department especially, it's about a 50-50 ratio of men to women. So that's really nice, especially because s and it is a very male dominated campus. Engineering is a very male dominated field. So being in a department that has a lot of that diversity is really, really nice. All right, so without any further ado, we'll get into the really fun stuff. I'll show you guys some cool demonstrations to uh, further explain the cool things ceramics can do. So we're gonna start off with a glass fiber pole and I'll just give you guys a brief overview into what glass is. So glass is an amorphous solid. Um, and basically what that means is that there's no long range atomic order. So for anything crystalline, you know, you, if you've got an atom here, you've got an atom here, I can count exactly where all of my atoms are gonna be. But in glass, it, that's not the case. If I have an atom here, I maybe have one here, I maybe have one up here, but past that I have no idea where the rest of my atoms are. So you can kind of see down in this figure right here, the crystalline structure is very regular, it's very organized and amorphous, is just all over the place. Um, and that is something that as ceramic engineers, we can kind of control to determine where our uh, materials are gonna end up and how they perform. Um, this amorphous structure is also the reason why you can see through glass. And the way that we make glass is we take all of our raw ingredients, bring them up to a really high temperature, they get really, really liquidy, they melt, and then they turn into a liquid. And then we take that liquid and we quench it really fast. We take it from a really high temperature down to a really low temperature like that. And that quenching does not allow your atoms to form together in a crystalline shape that's what causes them to freeze wherever they're at. So it's like, imagine taking waves in the ocean, immediately freeze all of them. You've still got waves up here, up here, over here, as, it, um, as compared to if you were to slowly cool waves down to freezing, they would even out to a full, to a flat surface. Um, and then because we do quench, that leaves a lot of residual stresses left over in our glass. And so we have to do a process called annealing to remove those stresses. And I'll go into that a little bit more in a second and just in our next demo. So we're gonna start off, get right into it. We're gonna come over here to our furnace. So this furnace is sitting at 1100 degrees C, so it's hot. All right, now I'm gonna have Sophie pull a fiber out of this molten glass right here. So now I've got this fiber right here. And this, because of its small diameter, has completely cooled. So it's cool to the touch. And this is like, this is how things like fiber optic cables are created. Not with this exact process because it would take a really long time. But this is a glass fiber that we pulled right in our lab right here. 
So that's one thing, glasses are ceramic, so that's something we can do. So now I'll go into a little bit of applications. Okay, so like I said, fibers like that can be used for fiber optic cables. So we can send information down those cables by using a higher index of refraction on the outside of the glass and a lower index of refraction on the inside. And that way the light bounces back and forth between the fiber all the way down the length of the fiber to send that information. So things like Google Fiber uses fiber optic cables. They're all over the place. Um, they can also be used in fiber reinforced composites. So that's just a mix of several different materials. Um, and the fibers in the composite uh, make the material much, much stronger because cracks can't uh, make their way through the fiber as easily as they can through a solid material. Um, things like uh, fiberglass insulation also uses fibers. Not this exact process, not pulling fibers like I just showed. Um, it's more like when you think of cotton candy being formed, that's, what, that's how uh, fiberglass insulation is created. Okay, so now we'll go into another glass demo. Um, so like I said just a little while ago, the stresses in glass have to be annealed out to prevent um, catastrophic failure. So like I said, quenching is how glass is formed. But when we do that, the outside of the glass cools much, much faster than the inside. So if you have a big blob of glass and you quench it really fast, the outside freezes in place immediately, but the inside still has a lot of heat. It's still really warm inside there. And so when that happens, the glass on the outside goes into a compression stress, but the glass on the inside goes into a tension stress. And so if we don't take care of that, it can, it basically looks like it blows up. It, <laughs> it breaks at the, at the speed of sound. It goes really fast. Um, so it can be super dangerous if we don't take care of those stresses. And again, we do that through a process called annealing, which is just taking the glass from a high temperature and very, very slowly cooling it down to room temperature. However, if we do controlled tempering, we can allow for a really, really high strength glass. And so now we'll kind of demonstrate what those stresses look like and what that means um, in an application. So we'll come over here. This is a polarizer. We've got uh, two panes of glass and they're polarized in opposite directions so that the light that shines through um, is only coming out in one direction. And so we can see this piece of glass is annealed. So there's no stresses. Why does so there's no stresses in this glass, but this glass has been tempered. So there's a lot of stresses in this glass. So can we get up really close? So if I shine this through here, you guys see that? There's like a rainbow of colors. And those colors indicate the stresses left in that piece of glass. But if I do the new glass, it's more gray. So again, if we break the compressor or the compression layer on the outside of this glass, it'll break immediately. And so we'll demonstrate that. So this piece of glass is tempered. And just by looking at it, you would never be able to tell. But I'm going to show you guys how we can tell. So I'm going to set this glass on the ground. So like I said, tempered glass is really, really, really high strength. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to stand on this glass. I stomp on it. I jump on it down on it. It's not breaking. It's not going anywhere. I can even take this metal ball and I can drop it. And my glass is still intact. But let's try this even bigger ball. And 
And again, my glass is still completely intact. However, like I said, if we can break that compression layer on the outside, we can show that this glass is tempered by the breakage pattern. So Sophie's gonna take my snipper right here and she's just gonna go in on that corner. And now we can see those, te that's, those tension forces on the inside spread out at the speed of sound to relieve that, those stresses inside the glass. And so this is what tempered glass when it's broken, this is what it looks like. This is annealed glass. So you can see the annealed glass, the stresses were nearly as high. So we get this spider web kind of cracking pattern. But again, with the tempered glass, it just blows into a bunch of bunch of different pieces. And so applications for this tempered glass includes car windows and phone screens. For the annealed glasses, there are things like window panes and glass art. So like when I was talking about the Gaffer's Guild earlier, all of those pieces have been annealed so that if they break, they don't burst into a million pieces. And this GIF on the bottom right here shows a Prince Rupert's drop. And that's just a piece of molten glass that's been dropped into a bucket of water. And like I said, it immediately quenches it into a solid. And this bulb on the end is super, super high strength. If you see right in here, that's a bullet. Someone shot a gun at this Prince Rupert's drop. And the reason it shatters is because the tail, which is really thin up here, vibrated enough that it, that it snapped and then it broke all the way down. So even with the force of a bullet, the Prince Rupert's drop will not break. So tempered glass is very, very high strength and it can be used in a lot of really cool applications. So this is just a short video to show what our Gaffer's Guild, what our hot glass shop can do on campus. So this was two years ago now, um, they were making a mug to sell in the St. Pat's sale. So the Gaffer's Guild is completely student run, student led, all the proceeds that they make from selling their glass pieces go right back into the shop so that they can keep it running and keep doing really cool, really cool stuff. So you can see by using that, the heat in the glass, he's able to control that to form the glass in whatever shape he wants. So here they are breaking it off the blowpipe to work on the opening of the mug. there's finished product. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about crystal structures. So like I said at the very beginning, ceramic engineers and material science engineers manipulate the microstructures of materials to determine the macroscopic properties. Um, for ceramics, there are seven crystal systems demonstrated here in the corner of my screen. Um, and by using those crystal systems and using different materials that uh, exhibit different structures, we can make really cool materials out of them. So this structure I have right here, I also have it on my screen right here. This is barium titanate. 
So this is a really cool material because if you can see in the center here, there's a very small atom. This is the titanium atom right in the center. When you push on this structure, you put this titanium atom out of where it usually is. And by doing that, you create an electrical current. So basically what that means is when you push, when you put a mechanical input into a barium titanate structure, you get an electrical output. So that can be used in all sorts of ways. They're used in capacitors. So these pictures I have over here, these are capacitors in cell phones. They're everywhere. Um, there's really cool things. I've seen stuff like, uh, if you guys have heard of the military um, using battery packs on their shoes to power uh, electrical things while they walk, um, that's because of uh, perovskite structures, they're called um, those materials that when you put the mechanical force on them, they create an electrical current. Um, so you can harvest that electrical current and use it in a bunch of different ways to create different really cool materials. And so this, this table right you see right here, this is something we see all the time as a ceramic engineer. Um, here's up here is all my input. So the one I was just talking about is a mechanical input and the electrical output, it's called piezoelectricity, where you put the mechanical force on it and you get an electrical current. Um, but other than that, all of these, all of these have some sort of ceramic material that go along with them. So ceramics can be used all over the place, not just in toilets or glasses, they can be used everywhere. So next I'm gonna to talk to you guys about thermal conductivity. Um, like I said at the very beginning, ceramics are really good at uh, heat. They, keep, they conduct heat poorly, they're very heat resistant. Heat must have matter to move through. And when it doesn't have matter to move through, it just stops. And ceramics are very porous, so they have lots of air trapped inside themselves. So you can see these pictures I have down here, the ceramics have all these pores, so heat cannot travel very well through there because there's nowhere, there's nowhere for it to get from point A to point B. So we're gonna demonstrate this one. This is a space shuttle tile. So this is what they line the outside of a space shuttle with um, to protect it from the heat from entering the atmosphere. So this protects the astronauts and all the electrical equipment from burning up in the atmosphere. So we're gonna show, we've got a torch right here. So just, we can see it's on. And I'm gonna heat this side up right here. And you can see now, this is red hot, but I can touch the back of it, no problem. It's completely cool on the other side. There's no heat passing through this material to keep my hand safe on this side. So something this thin traps the heat so well that I don't, that I don't get burned on the other side. And that was red hot, it was glowing red hot. And then obviously you can see it dissipated very, very quickly. And that's because the ceramic is very good at um, protecting itself from heat degradation. And like I said, applications for this include spatial tiles. So right here, these would be all ceramics. This is exactly what I just showed you. They're lining that space shuttle to prevent it from burning up in the atmosphere. Um, we also use them for refractory bricks. So those are things that line the outside of a furnace to keep the heat in. Um, like I showed earlier with the fiber pole, this is our furnace that's at 1100 degrees. Surrounding that is ceramics. Those are refractories, so they keep the heat in. And they're also very, very resistant to the heat. So we can use them over and over and over again without them burning up or melting or anything. So ceramics are all around you. I hope after this little bit, this little presentation, I hope you can kind of see that more now. Um, like I showed, they're in your phones. Those electrical ceramics are all, all over the place. They use them in computers, uh, dental implants. They're very chemically resistant, so they're safe for body use. Windows, like I showed, glass bottles, um, lasers, concrete, DVD players, IR motion sensors, stoves, and yes, toilets. Um, but ceramics are everywhere. They're, they're a very, very cool material. There's lots you can do with it. 
you pick a field you want to go into, you can go into it with ceramics. So ceramics are utilized in everyday life, even if you guys don't realize it, kind of like I just said. And there's advanced versus traditional ceramics. So I talked a lot about the advanced ceramics today, but there are a lot of traditional ceramics. That's the things like the refractory bricks and stuff. Um, but there's lots of growth to be done in ceramics. If you guys um, are interested in going to a field where there's lots of things to discover and lots of growth to be had, ceramics is a really great place to do it because they are on the cutting edge. Advanced ceramics are on the cutting edge of technology right now. There's fields everywhere to go into. Um, and like I said, there's fun places to go. There's really big names, NASA, Tesla, uh, SpaceX, all over the place. There's You can go anywhere with ceramics. Um, and there's lots of fun things to do. And right here at the bottom, I have a QR code. Um, we have a free summer camp this summer, and it is virtual, so you can do it from anywhere uh, for juniors and seniors. So if you guys are interested in that, um, go ahead and go to that link, go to that QR code and check it out. Um, and then my last page just has a couple extra resources. If you guys are really interested in this, check any of these out. They're, they've got really good information and really good um, diagrams and more demonstrations to show. So with that, I think I'm done. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'll open it up now. Please just type your question in the chat and we'll answer. Claire, so a question that I'll start off with just to get things going would be, could you answer why you chose Missouri S&T and then related why you chose specifically ceramic engineering? To yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So I grew up in Kansas City, Missouri, so I'm only about three hours outside of Rolla. Um, and in high school, I really, really enjoyed my science and my math classes. So engineering seemed like the way to go. Um, and then I visited s and and decided I really liked the campus, I really liked the buildings, I liked the atmosphere. Um, so that's why I decided on s and For ceramics, I actually didn't come into s and as a ceramic engineer. I started off as a chemical engineer um, because, I, like I said, I really, really liked chemistry in high school. So I was thinking, oh, I really like chemistry. Obviously, I need to go to chemical engineering. And it turns out chemical engineers don't actually do much fun chemistry. <laughs> it's the ceramics that do the fun chemistry. So that's what drove me into ceramics and why I ended up where I'm at. Uh, no, so I did not tour any other engineering schools. Um, I came to s and and I fell in love with it immediately. Like I said, I really, really enjoyed the campus. I liked the location. I liked the buildings um, and everything it had to offer. There's ceramics are only offered at, I think, two colleges, for two, undergrad. for yeah, for undergraduate ceramics are only offered um, at two universities in the nation. So if you guys are interested in ceramics, <laughs> you're really limited on options, but s and is a really great place to come. We've got really great professors and really great atmosphere. They don't have anything else. I know I went kind of fast through that. If you've got any questions, if I breezed over something, if you're confused about anything, please let me know. I can go back over anything. So the next question we've got for you then, Claire, is can you talk about in high school, uh, what were your favorite science class may have been? Yeah, yeah. So I took chemistry my sophomore year of high school. Um, I knew I liked science before that, but my first science class I actually took in high school as a biology class and I hated it. I hated biology. It was, it just did not click for me. I didn't like the material. So after that, I was like, oh, well, maybe science isn't what it is, what I want. Um, and then I took my chemistry class and then all of a sudden it was like, oh, that's what I like. That's what I'm here for. That's what I really enjoy doing. Um, I really like the hands-on aspect. I like being in a lab. Um, playing with my torches and my chemicals and stuff. I really enjoy all that stuff. Um, so yeah, my favorite science in high school was definitely chemistry. So as a follow-up question, what is your favorite part about being in the ceramic engineering department at Missouri S&T? Yeah, absolutely. So 
obviously I'm really passionate about what we do and what we learn and I really enjoy what we're learning. But my favorite part of the ceramic engineering department has to be um, the relationships I've made through this department. The teachers are amazing. I love all of my professors. They're very understanding. They're fun to be with. I like hanging out with them. And on top of that, I really enjoy all my classmates. Everyone's very kind. Engineers get a bad rap that they're bad at talking and bad at social skills, but ceramics, you're, the ceramic engineers here, they're easy to get along with. I have lots of friends. I've got a lot of really close friends that I've made through this department. So definitely the relationships are my favorite part of this department. Do you have any advice, Claire, for students who might still be in high school, things that they can do to, to help prepare themselves for engineering, for, for starting off in college? Yeah, absolutely. So we do have that summer camp, um, but I know universities across the nation have summer camps that you can go into to get a little bit more hands-on experience, get some of that knowledge that requires you to uh, use as um, an undergraduate. So. If you guys are looking at anything engineering related, I would highly, highly, highly recommend getting into it now. I did not have any engineering classes in high school. I didn't have any ceramics classes in high school. Um, but if I had, I, I think it would have set me up in a position where I would have not come in as a chemical engineer. I would have known what I wanted to do sooner. Um, so yeah, just get involved right now. If you've got engineering clubs, robotics, uh, summer camps, anything you can do, get your hands on it and do it. We have a question as well about the courses that you've taken to get a ceramic engineering degree. If you could kind of talk about what those have looked like since you are a senior. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so engineering uh, general education classes don't look like most general education classes at other colleges. Um, we have to take chemistry classes, lots of chemistry classes. I took calculus one, calculus two, calculus three, and differential equations. So I took four different math classes um, to even mark that engineering uh, or mark that box in my engineering degree. That wasn't even ceramics related. Um, I had to take physics one, physics two. For ceramics, we have to take modern physics, um, took statics, which is like the physics of things that aren't moving and then mechanics of materials, which is the physics of things that are moving. <laughs> kind of, that was a hard class. I don't, I don't really remember. I try to block it out. Um, so lots of, lots of sciences, lots of math classes. Um, I took all my history and English credits in high school. I got dual credit for those. So I haven't really done any of those in a long time. Um, but ceramics related courses specifically, we have, crystallography and that's where you learn about stuff like this structures and things um, we have a lot of different labs so your sophomore year and your junior year you're required to take a lab every semester and that's when you're actually in the lab like performing experiments writing lab reports um, doing presentations so those were, those were some of my favorite classes because they were so hands-on. Like I said, I really enjoy that hands-on aspect. Um, and then a lot of like the nitty gritty, like uh, the electrical properties of ceramics, kind of like I was talking about with the piezoelectrics, um, the mechanical properties. So how we can control that microstructure to make really, really strong, high strength uh, structural ceramics. Um, so a lot of really specialized classes, um, but yeah, there's like, there's a whole bunch. There's a lot of different technical electives you can take if you're interested in one type of ceramics over another. There's a lot of technical electives you can take to dig deeper into those kind of courses. Something else that I'll point out that Claire had touched on is those general sort of courses that all of our engineers take. So at s and we have 15 kinds of engineering and the first year for them is the same across the board. It's taking calculus one, it's taking chemistry one, taking physics one. So it does give you that flexibility if you, like Claire, come in thinking you want a certain type of engineering and then change your mind that you're really not gonna fall too far behind because of that first year being a common year. Yeah, yeah. So when I did change my major, I changed my major 
before I started my sophomore year, but it didn't set me back at all because I hadn't actually gotten into any of those chemical engineering courses. Um, and like Tyler was saying, um, as a freshman, you come in, you start off with a freshman engineering class and that's where you learn about all the different types of engineering. They go every week, you, you go into a different type of engineering and you write a little report on it, you learn more about it. So uh, s and really sets you up really well to choose the kind of engineering that you're most interested in. The next question for you, Claire, is could you talk about what you're wanting to do after graduation? Yeah, absolutely. So I graduate next semester, but I'm actually staying at s and I'm going to be here for a couple more years. I'm going to do my master's. Um, currently, I'm looking into getting into more of the glass side of ceramics or the structural side. Um, so I haven't done a whole lot of digging into it yet since I still got a little bit before I do graduate, but I'll be here for a while. Um, and then after that, I'm gonna head back to Kansas City and work a little bit, pay off some debt, and then hopefully find my dream job. You mentioned that you had an internship or a co-op and then I also recall you saying how you were uh, working with Brewer Science. Would you mind talking about your experience through that co-op or internship or with Brewer Science? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I worked with GE Aviation. I took a semester off last semester. I went and worked full time with GE Aviation. I was in Madisonville, Kentucky. Um, and it's kind of hard for me to describe exactly my, do my job description because everything got thrown off because of COVID. Thankfully, I was still able to go and work in person. So I was there the whole three months working with them in person. So I'm very grateful for that. Very lucky with that one. Um, but I did a lot of uh, industrial, not industrial, um, like line work, um, manufacturing, thank you. Manufacturing engineering uh, was that kind of role. Um, so I did a lot of that stuff last semester right now I am working with Brewer Science and like I said they're a semiconductor company and I'm doing quality engineering through them so obviously I'm manufacturing the quality engineering service can go anywhere you can do anything you want with it um, and then this summer I'm working with Catalent which is a pharmaceutical company and I'll be doing process engineering with them so uh, yeah I really like it it's Brewer right now is all online so I'm just working from home and working on my computer but and that's been good. That's been a lot more um, hands-on kind of stuff than GE was. We have a question in the chat for you, Claire, about what is your dream job? So after you would graduate with that uh, master's. Oh, that's a really, really good question. Um, I do enjoy being in the lab and doing those hands-on experiments. So I think somewhere in the research and development area would be really, really cool. Uh, I like to do the inventing, the research, the let's come up with new stuff. Let's solve the, this problem. Um, so somewhere in the research and development field, I think would be very, very cool. Right, so uh, someone was wanting to know if you could explain what process engineers do. Yeah, yeah. So I haven't started that position just yet, so I can't give you specifics. Um, but from what I understand, they oversee the process of uh, products going from raw material all the way through final product. So I'm pretty sure what I'll be doing with this summer is um, Oh yeah, do you want to talk about it? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay. So actually I did process engineering on my co-op. So I was at Sandia and we were doing manufacturing. Um, and so what process engineering is, you're looking at, um, like um, Claire was saying, how you have like a raw powder to a solid like ceramic piece. And so there's a lot of steps in between that happen with that. So you have to, your material has to have like a certain phase and you have to put it in the furnace a couple of times. You have to change what your particles look like so because your powder is like tiny little grains but depending on what shape and what like your morphology and how like what size it is um it really impacts your material properties when you center it into a full um solid piece so you look at each of those steps there's actually like we had like 16 different steps from like raw powder to like the final like centered piece and so you there's like so many factors for each of those steps and so you're working on 
each of those factors to um, make sure that your final product is good. Because a lot of times with ceramics, you get a lot of cracking. So you have to um, troubleshoot where your cracks are coming from because you have like, you can have over 30 different factors and all of them could be causing your cracking, <laughs> but if only one of them is actually the culprit. <laughs> so it becomes really complicated. Appreciate you guys taking the time tonight to come and learn about ceramic engineering. Um, we really hope that you want to come and join us. We'd love to have you in our department. Um, we love running the summer camp. It's a really great opportunity. We end up having lots and lots of people that participate in the summer camp join our department because it's an, it's an awesome hands-on experience. We're planning to run that in person this summer, actually. Um, you can get, you get to get into the lab, you get to do a little mini project. Um, you we try to bring people in from industry so that you can hear about what they do and what you might do when you graduate from here with a ceramic engineering degree. Um, and you just get to see all of our lab spaces and all of the fun stuff that we get to do. So we'd love to have you. If you have any further questions about that, please go to summer.mst.edu and you can find our summer camp. My contact information is there as well. So feel free to reach out to me if you have any specific questions about our materials camp. Yeah, so like Dr. Wilkerson just said, thank you guys so much for showing up tonight and letting me talk at you for a little while. I hope you really enjoyed um, the little bit of demonstration we got to show you guys. Uh, so yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing all of you here in a couple of years. <laughs>